right, guys. This is episode eight of uh, Carpe Vinum. I'm Quattro Kowalski, Andrew Holbrook, and our guest today is Daniel Colada. Did I say that right? Yeah, you got it. It's awesome. like it's like pina, just spelled different. Pina Colada, Mr. Daniel Pina Colada. Um, today we're doing setting of a reputation. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can uphold. <laughs> today we're doing Spanish reds. Uh, we've got some cool uh, red wines in here for us to dive into. Um, so let's do it. I'm, I'm thirsty. I like when we jump in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so how'd you pick Spanish wines today? Why, why today Spanish wines? We've been kind of doing um, like broader... Regional focuses. Yeah. Like last time we did uh, red Bordeaux's. Um, We've done northern Italian reds, so just did Spanish oh, okay. reds. Just kind of working our way through stuff. Yeah. Um, I've been waiting for this one for a while, though, like... Spanish wines like hit me right it's in the jam. right in the soul. You me know? too. So, me uh, too for sure. And this one's a heck of a one to start out with. Actually, uh, Lopez and Heredia, you know, like one of the most iconic wine producers out of Rioja. Um, certainly one of the oldest ones. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. this is a Rioja. It's a Rioja. Got it. Yeah, over a hundred and forty year old winer. Which is wow. Yeah. Which says a lot. Yeah. And so the wineries that old are the vines that old. Um, give or take, I mean, you find some 100-plus-year-old vines, but it just depends on the vineyard. Like, this is one of their newer vineyards. Um, so, so vines here are probably 40 to 60-year-old. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for them, it's like, oh, these are fairly young, you yeah. know, because there's a lot of, um, not a lot, but there's some grapes in Rioja that are made it through phylloxera. Right. So I don't know, probably this didn't, but, but there are some that exist, so I've yeah. seen some of these. To, to answer your question... 80% Tempranillo, 15% Garnacha, 5% Graciano Masuelo blend. Um, I think what's interesting, and you'll find this in a lot of Spanish wines, like this one is aged 10 years before they even let it out to the public. So you don't find, first of all, many people capable of holding inventory that long, and also like people just don't age them that long before they release. People are always trying to get to market pretty quickly. So this is a Reserva, which means what, two years in oak and then... Like, yeah, so here we're, it's, it is where it gets complicated. So right. technically 36 months, of which two of those years have to be in oak, okay. the extra year in bottle, and then it can't be released until at least 36 months after the vintage date. Um, when you get to your Grand Reserver, you talk about 60 months. Um, uh, what's interesting also, like, um, there's a total shift in the world of Tempranillo in Spain, in terms of that traditional producer, which this very much is, this is the oldest producer uh, in uh, Rioja, um, and particularly the oldest, the first producer in Haro, the capital of Rioja. But there's a there's a shift. There's like this mentality of a, a traditional producer that ages wines extensively, which means when you go to that bodega, in this particular case, they have 10,000, 11,000 barrels or more just sitting there aging wines um, because they, that's the traditional style. And it's typically all American oak. So the modern approach is shift from American oak, this kind of herbal type of oak, to a more to French oak, which is a little bit cleaner, a little bit more fruity, a little bit more pretty, uh, but they don't age it for nearly as long as what you see in La Rioja. Interesting. So that would take up quite a bit of real estate, wouldn't you think, Holbrook? <laughs> 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 I mean, you got to think about. So, I'm going to throw a few pictures up here. I've actually been here. It's a huge oh, no awesome. warehouse. Um, it is just like he said, and they're not little like normal size barrels. They're um, punchins or punchins. punchins or whatever. Five hundred like liter, five hundred liter, huge barrels, and it's just like a warehouse full of these things, and temperature yeah. controlled and all that stuff. They're really like. Um, I wonder, for lack of a better term, they were really bitchy about how they aged everything is like the humidity was within one or two percent and the temperature was one or two percent like 14 degrees celsius and 55 percent humidity or something similar to that M maybe more humidity actually um but they it was like very like controlled and digitized and everything cool also is the coolest tasting room i think i've ever been in mm. it's a uh, you want if you if you I mean, it's going to be up there pinky swear 
Oh, is that the for one me? That... If you if you took a slice of a decanter and like cut it right in the middle, that's what it looks like. You'll see what, it up is here. it laying down? Uh, like it's, no decanter, and so there's like a little door in the bottom, oh. and you just go in, and then once you get in, yeah. there's like one of the some like historical wooden bar where they actually do the tastings. So it's like this crazy juxtaposition of this like modern glass decanter looking thing, and then in the back of it for the tastings is this huge ornate wood bar. That's awesome. Super cool. What's interesting to see modern architecture with traditional yeah, language. like super. I mean, well, I feel like you see a lot of that around Spain in general. Yeah, Spain I agree. really kind of embraces the the new while um, kind of dragging the old into yeah into the the new. If that makes any yeah, sense, it is. Well, it is. they have so much to reference to. I mean, you look at all the architecture in Barcelona and Madrid with. Uh, what is it, Gaudi? Yeah. You yeah. know, like, what an extreme designer. Uh, and I can definitely see how that parallels to the to the buildings of the bodegas. So, not to cut you short, but getting back to the wine, it's, there's a lot going on here. Yeah. I mean, just on the nose, it's... It's so rustic and savory yes. and, like, dried leaf and autumnal and just beautiful. Uh, if you like that style of wine, and then on the palate, the acid dominates, and the question is, is do you like that style? Mm -hmm. For me, I want lamb and pot roast with this. Amen. Yeah. Um, I feel like if I just sat here and drank it while I could, I would very quickly get very hungry, you know? Yeah. This is definitely crying for food. Yeah. 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 This is, we've had some wines on the show that, like you said, we could we could sit here and drink all day, and then we've had some wines that... Really cry out for make, make your mouth water, please. Yeah, yeah. You don't ever. You have fit to right ask. in. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. don't ever have to ask. It's that um, first taste once you get going. Yeah, yeah. I told you it didn't take long. It's like, like a, it's like a can of Pringles. Once you, <laughs> once you <laughs> pop, you can't, you can't stop. stop it. That's true. <laughs> I love it. So um, that's awesome uh, about how long. I mean. Just to look at the bottle, this is an 07. It's 07. Like, and Where were you, you in 2007? My memory does not go that far back. I was opening my first restaurant. 13 or working years on opening ago. my first restaurant. I was living in Dallas, maybe? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. 13 I was years. being an idiot in Dallas, I don't know. Um, I wasn't even married then. <laughs> So think about that. Like how, <laughs> how long they've just been sitting there aging yeah, these wines. This has been like, waiting for us to, to yeah, drink on yeah, this show. Yeah, and yeah, this, is a, this is a current release? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's well, a seven. It's a seven. Yeah, because it's just now releasing the seven. They were at sixes until like maybe three or four okay. months ago. Okay. So just to give you a heads up and everybody else a heads up, we, we try and keep all of our wines that we buy from total, total wine okay. at around $50 or below. So we want it to be a good bottle of wine, but we want it to be still approachable. Okay. Well, um, that's that drinks way above its pay grade. Absolutely. I mean, this is it's great. It is very approachable. I mean, I think because it's been aging for a while, like it's some of these bottles we open, like it's put together, but it's like here and there and here. And like for me, this is like it's right out of the bottle. It's like pretty smooth, easy to drink. I think it really could have used some decanting though. Decanting and like, I bet you could drink this wine 15 years from now. Absolutely. And have no problem with it. I don't know where that would go though. Like I can't I can't picture in my head like what it would do to these flavors. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> would it subtle them out? I, I have a question about how long it could age. I think it could go longer. I don't know about that long, mainly because it's so acid driven mm -hmm. and as the wine ages that acid characteristic is gonna be amplified because it starts to turn into some volatile acidity. So so then the question is, is there enough body, enough fruit, enough structure there to keep up with that increase in acid? Maybe not. Um, or would this make an exquisite red wine vinegar? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean Yeah. I, I I think it's I think if you like high toned uh, acidic wines that uh, not not in the faulted way, but that are in the very savory, make you salivate great with food, I think you got five years. I think that if you aren't that, then I would drink it. Because it, for me, it's it's soft on the palate. The tannins aren't, I don't get cat tongue. No, yeah. no there's none yeah. of that going on. Like, you know? So um, do you always talk about how you get sugars and acid confused? Yeah. You don't on this wine, I'm guessing. No, no. Mm -hmm. He's the one who set me straight on that, by the way. 
Yeah, what did what, I say? Just well, I just because we were doing did level one and I was tasting this, and you're like, no, 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 it's not sugar. There's no sugar in this wine. Oh, okay. It's just acid, and you and and you taught me to like. He did he set oh. you straight with a ball gag and a whip? <laughs> <laughs> no, with a blooper reel. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not, <laughs> oh, maybe a couple more glasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's this topic has come up for me a lot when we're tasting on the show, like wh where I perceive acid and sugar in my mouth, and oh, I, okay. I mix them up quite a bit, and like yeah, I kind of feel like I've sorted it out now. Yeah, I mean, you, you've evolved a lot since I first met you in terms it's, of hey, I not your looks, but thing. your wine, but your <laughs> wine belt. Yes, I got older. <laughs> <laughs> you were yeah, yeah. So, Daniel, this is a, like perfect segue to like. T Tell audience like a little bit about yourself, also about the Novium. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. thanks for the opportunity to please, please, to please. talk a little bit about myself because I don't like to. <laughs> no, I don't either. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I'm a longtime wine professional. I have been in hospitality twenty years now. Um, kind of worked every part of the industry in terms of front of the house, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, uh, wine bars cocktail bars, uh, ghetto bars, <laughs> uh, uh, fine dining, hotels, worked many years for Marriott property and the Renaissance properties here in the Arboretum. Uh, and then in, uh, let's see, 2007, I was struggling through college and uh, ended up graduating in 2009. And at that time, the, the recession in Austin had just hit. And so I was doing, I was kind of doing pharmaceutical work, research, during the day and working at night. At uh, at that point, I had transitioned from the Renaissance and the Arboretum to the Grove uh, at BKs and 360. Oh, really? Cougar really. Town, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we sold a lot of Cougar juice. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. So that was circa works. 2008 ish. I think that's when the Grove opened there. Um, and I, pretty much right after that, I had started uh, kind of developing a plan to start my own business and. Ended up creating a company called Gusto or Gusto Tastings that was kind of geared towards restaurant um, restaurant consulting, event planning, wine education. At that time, I had no formal education whatsoever in terms of a certification. It was wine was just an interest and something that we had to, to learn for the job. Uh, and ended up partnering with a wine school out of Denver called the International Wine and Spirits Guild to help them bring uh, certifications to Texas. Uh, and then started teaching for that school in 2010. And then uh, had a student in 2011. I was teaching the advanced wine certification, which is basically uh, a 60-hour course. Talk about 13 countries, and it's pretty in depth. Uh, his name was Craig Mayer. Craig Mayer is. Hi, Craig. Hey, Craig. If you're watching this at some point in the future, future, future me says hello. Um, yeah, met Craig in 2011, and we said, well, let's do something in the wine industry together. And uh, we basically started a consulting company. And Craig is a former anthropologist and archaeologist, and he excavated at a Roman in a Roman fort in Northern England when he was doing his uh, graduate de uh, degree uh, called Venovium. And so Venovium is a Latin word that means on the wine road. It just felt perfect for what we were trying to do in the wine industry. And so we created a consulting company called Venovium Partners, so On the Wine Road Partners. Nice. And uh, had a client in Houston, a winery client, that we helped uh, at least start the process of getting them uh, going with a keg wine program. And then they changed ownership, then they went out of business, and then we said, well, let's just do it for ourselves. And so we started a winery here in Texas in 2012, and we started out life basically the first four and a half years in Lakeway, just west of Austin. And then in 2016, we moved to 30 acres in the Texas Hill Country and opened up a tasting room. And it's it's been a, a beautiful thing just because we try to stand out. Keg wines are unique. Uh, we make cocktails out of our wines. We're drinkers. We like to open late and have parties and do all kinds of events and classes, as you know. And so it's been a, it's been a, a really great ride. That's awesome. Well, and keg wine isn't... Um, isn't like bottled wine where you have to drink the whole bottle right as you right. pour it. I mean, it, it has almost an indefinite shelf life, right? I mean, it's definitely pretty long. We, you know, for us, keg wines was one of those things. We're in the Texas wine industry. At, you know, 2012, 2013, there was a major bias against Texas wines, and probably there still is. If you haven't had a Texas wine, shame on you, go support local. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, particularly now, COVID has been a, a, I'm sweating because of COVID in terms of all the wineries that are stressing out over it. But the reality is, is having a wine on tap is a guaranteed by the glass, which means that it, you typically are able to sample that product more. You're able to get more volume out. And because it's on tap, you can sample without the fear of waste. Sure. And so from the business perspective, it's uh, better margin, no waste, no spoilage, no corkage. It's just a really beautiful solution that if, if you can find the right wine for the right account or the right customer, uh, then it works really well. But our kegs, we use 100% recyclable one-way keg. So uh, customers, people who have weddings or corporate events or kegs for the office, I mean, it's a really beautiful thing to, to be able to have a keg in your home. There's a lot of people who drink two, three glasses a day. I'm not judging. Um, it's just the reality. It's just the reality. So if a keg holds 26 bottles, in our case, uh, that's basically a month worth of wine at, at, at a wine that drinks above its pay grade for what you're paying for just because you're not paying for the label, the cold labels, etc. Yeah. And you're not, you're not ever committing the, the, the sin of throwing a bottle of wine away because it still has wine in it that went bad. That's that true. That's three days ago and you forgot about That's it. That's true. And your neighbors don't get to see you throw out a whole container of bottles that... Uh, you know, that's kind of a point of pride on my street. <laughs> my my neighbors are used to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of you ask me all the time, like, hey, um, I know you know a bunch about Texas wine. Like, where's best tasting rooms to go? This is always on my list. Oh, okay. It's the most... What's the right word? Eclectic tasting room that I know of in in the in the wine well, Texas wine country. It's like it definitely. It's not out. just their wine. So um, yeah. they have a little bit from this producer, a little bit from that producer. A great way to test to taste a multiple of Texas wines, and then they have some non-Texas wines. So it's really nice to. Um, they do a program Texas versus the world, and it's like really great way to taste, for example, there's Tempranillo is a huge grape in Texas. And to be able to taste the Tempranillo from Texas up against something like this, sure. real interesting to do. Yeah. I, I'm glad you mentioned that um, in terms of the, 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 the exposure of different wine types and pro meeting different producers. Even within the Vinovium brand, even though that brand is entirely on tap and in kegs, all of our production is very collaborative. So we work with anywhere between seven and 10 different producers in a given vintage to make wines mm, that uh, we participate in and then that becomes part of that Vinovium product. I dig it, dude. Well, y'all have got a great, y'all are doing some great stuff out there. I, we Thank you. always stop by when we're on our way just because it's, you know, it's- And it's open late. Like that's the biggest thing. You stay until nine, 10 o'clock sometimes, so. Yeah. So, Speaking of wow, Tempranillo, color. I'm excited about this wine. I'm excited about pre routes in general. So and so is the wine world right now. Like it's it's a it's a darling. It's a darling, and it's become, for lack of a better word, trendy. Yeah, it's this. It's so hot right now. <laughs> that pre route's so hot. It right is now. so hot. Drop it like it's hot. So <laughs> no, no, you're you're missing my. It's so hot right now. I'm, um, this is dad joke. And then I'm forgetting the movie. God. It's up here. It's so hot right it is, now. It's One of right there. references. Oh, shit. It's going to come to me. Anyway, go keep going. Can we Please. cuss on this show? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. It's, it's required. So um, a little bit about Priorat. Um, it's in southern Spain. It's basically a match. No, 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 no. It's not? No. What's the show? Eastern Spain? So Northeast of Catalonia. The movie. The about uh, Zoolander. It's so hot right now. West of Barcelona. <laughs> Zoolander, right here. Barcelona's in southern Spain. <laughs> no, it's not. It's so hot right now. So hot right now. So hot right now. Absolutely. Barcelona is on the eastern side of Spain. It's on the southeast. Uh, on the Pyrenees. <laughs> this is where Priorat is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Edit whoever's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's southeast. Yeah. Southeast. Southeast Spain. Southeast Spain. No, no, it's Southeast Spain. <laughs> it's like an hour east of Barcelona, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's Barcelona's no, on the coast. There's not yeah, much but on the, east of Barcelona because it's on the coast. Like I said. guess. I, I guess. Okay. We depend. Yes. What are we? Arguing? But it's not south. Like south is like Jerez. Yeah. Like yeah. East. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's closer to France. Yes. Okay. Well, it's next to Catalonia. There you go. Um, <laughs> Jeez. It's on a mountain. It's on. This, it's. It's like a donut on the side of a mountain, um, yeah. and it's this like heavily terraced area. 
they grow typically three or four grapes. Grenache is always seems to be kind of the dominant one in all of these. So I said uh, there's Yeah, none there's here. none. I was gonna let it slip. Uh, so GSM is happening a lot there. Um, but G G Grenache, hey, certainly hey, Grenache. What does GSM stand for? Grenache Syrah Mavedra. Okay. Yeah. I but saw that. I've been seeing that a lot, and I'm like, where's where's my key? I don't. There I don't, we go. Yeah. It's right. I just gave it to you. Yeah. So, What's interesting about this blend is this is not a traditional. Not a typical blend from. Yeah, so, other than it's Grenache dominant, I well, guess. Like. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you go buy this wine on the, sh if you pick up this bottle and you see Priorat Grenache Syrah Carignan Merlot, you automatically know that this is kind of a new world. Styled wine, I expect new French oak. It's going to be more fruity than rustic. Um, definitely a modern approach to the region, which you're seeing a lot, right? Like so, there's yeah. it's the same thing you see in Spain. Like there's these old producers. Like some of those grapes have been around seven years. Not a lot this of them. You have to funky. find them. But I mean, it's super funky. What am I? What is that? <laughs> this is funk with a little funk. Yeah, this is funk on top of funk. We want the funk in here. For me, it's got like that, the 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 aromatics of like a cave age blue cheese, almost yeah. like a holy like oh a, man. the rind of a it just nice nice cheese, but also very meaty and totally. Dense. But it, the what you get on your palate is totally different than you get in the nose. Yeah, the palate's soft and a little bit fruitier. Yeah, I I almost get like rose petals. I and, like I think that I hate to generalize, but like for me, that's pretty. General of Priot Rot, there's not these like huge in your face, like um, crazy oak and all these things it going on. They tend like to be thinner. like paint thinner. Mm. Do you get that? Is uh, it, could another word for paint thinner be like yes. nail polish? Yes, well, it smells chemical that burns your nose, it smells chemically. Yeah. Well, 14 and a half alcohol. That's what I'm like every time I smell that <clears> in my eye, it's just high in alcohol. Sure, and that's but there's a little bit of I can see how you could get that that ethyl acetate character. Yeah, there you go, an acetate. But it's not. It, it's kind of complementary. It brings out more of that rose petal, rose yeah, water character. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Like that's um, great. Yeah. So just... so so classic soils for pre rot are slate, so dark soils, um, and it's one of these regions of the world that is uh, phylloxera resistant because of that slate. Same type of soil that's in the Moselle Valley. Um, I didn't know that. That's good to know. <coughs> I mean, I guess. No, that doesn't make any sense. So it's not. The, so I'm sure some of this, okay, depending on the producer, is pre phylloxera vines. Um, but as a result of that, you tend to get almost like this intense. Oh, I, I can't say tar, but I remember in elementary school, they when we took took us out for recess at one summer or one year, they were tarring the roof of the school, and that smell always resonates with me. It's, Hot asphalt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, or a tire that's been run for a long time. Is yeah. that Grenache for you? Do you, you feel like that is? Um, that, for that, me, that's that. For me, that's more Carignan. Carignan. Yeah. Yeah. The traditional producer, typically, the more Carignan in the blend, the the more traditional the wine is. But it seems that Carignan, because it's so tar and dark and I don't want to say petrol, but. Um, Almost like rubbery matchstick yeah. sulfur. Yeah. Um, it tends to be less of a blend in a modern style wine. So, I feel like this could use some age. Yeah, totally. Like, I would be interested to see what this two or three years from now. Well, what this drinks like when it's as old as the one we just tried, the Rioja. Like at 2027, it. I bought half a case of this yesterday. Oh, perfect. So <laughs> we so can we'll, do this every we'll six months it. if we yeah, want yeah. to. Are yeah. you talking about pricing? Uh, yeah. Just less than 50? That's the Everything's less than 50. I think this one came in at like 30 bucks, 28 really? bucks or 30 bucks. Wow, that's like, a good deal. That's awesome. I, for me, too. Like, yeah, I thought, I thought it was. Why that's why it. I bought it. I was like, yeah. Eh. And I'm a big fan of I love Grenache as a varietal. So, like, anytime me I too. can get my hands on. Grenache of any well, sort. I'm I don't know for. if you remember that big dinner that we had, um, but I pulled out that I pulled out a, a pre rot Alto Mancayo Manca or it's X Zit or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Is that that uh, super expensive one? No, well, that night might have been the case. Like yeah. Hmm. Anyway, to me, this is this is screaming for some red meat. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, it definitely can hit because it's almost irony too. Like yeah, like uh, like like that like that iron that you get in a rare piece of meat. Yeah, uh, would be delicious with a heavy char. Or maybe and like some root vegetables, so blood sausage or something. Yeah, like I think Marguez. of. I think of like a fillet in particular that has that the bacon around it. Mm, I could <laughs> see that. To go with the Syrah oh, and then the heavy oh, char on the fillet. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe that uh, that leg of uh, pork that you. Mm, oh, come on, you God. That You doing there, that this year? I am doing this year. It, come on, every year. <laughs> Are we gonna bring that on the show? <laughs> we will bring it on the show. Can I be <laughs> here again on that? Yeah. Day? <laughs> Even if I'm not on the show, can I come and just like steal ham in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> We'll just we'll just throw it to you. Yeah, I'll do it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, this it's is super pretty. So there's a reason why this is so trendy, so hot right now. Because it's well, good. Wine. It's not your it's not your Rioja and it's not your Ribera del Duero, right? It's yeah. like another whole region of Spain that's like doing something with completely different grapes. Um, there's a pretty interesting history behind the whole thing. Um, and side note, we've talked about classifications of wine in different regions like DOCG and all these ones. There's only two DOQs, right, in, in all of Spain? I, th I think this is right. Rob Moshine told me this yeah. the other day. Well, the, um, I, don't, I don't know. I what mean, he told me is that Rioja... And Priorat are the only two places in Spain that have DOQ. For those who don't know, DOQ is think, uh, uh, it's it's the highest quality of wine in Spain. Here, I'll, I'll De, to I'm going to say it in Italian. I'll speak Spanish. Denominación origen qualificada. Qualificada. Yeah. So that sounded pretty Spanish to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's true anymore. I, I think that there's one in Ribera. Well, or unlike, two in Ribera unlike Ribera. France and Italy, I feel like um, some of the laws in Spain Spencer for quality like can well, uh, well, cha change yeah. more fluidly than... Well, that, and then you also have within that, you have like the a group of producers or a region that comes in and says, okay, these are the top producers, like yeah. the Vino de Pago. And the Vino de Pago is totally an independent thing that's not related to the classification system but those are throughout spain most of them are in uh, castilla la mancha also within castilla leon and um, humilla um, but those are like the, the the top producers of those regions outside of the quality classification um, in terms of the the like the dop or the doq status of priorat it's relatively new i mean uh, it didn't happen until 2009. Wow, I didn't know. So I, I don't know if it's just, um, I can't remember if it's just La Rioja and uh, Priorat. Um, I mean, Ribera del Duero has done quite a bit in the last and we, decade. So that was my question when I was talking to Rob, is that how does Ribera del Duero not have a DOQ status? Because yeah. if you ask me, some of the best wines in the entire world come from Ribera totally. del Duero. So I well, was really perplexed, like, how that's even possible. Yeah. Well, I uh, think that's very recent, though, since, like, the 1980s, 90s, something like that. The whole classification? No, no, that, that Ribera du, del Duero has good wines. It used to be kind of swill. Mm. I, I mean, know. I think it's I've had some vintage Unicos that go way back before the '90s that are pretty. Uh, yeah, sure, the, but I mean, there's there was only a couple uh, bodegas there that were making good wine, yeah. um, and all the rest were yeah. just kind of an afterthought. So, anyway, I could be yeah. Talking the out my the dates all get confusing on some level, um, but needless to say, great wine. Uh, I was gonna say, what's you know, obviously we're talking about Grenache here, and it's interesting to see how Grenache has. T or in Spain, Garnacha taken to France and Grenache. And now you, I think the reason it's trending and hot is, is, is because of the whole GSM play. You know, these Rhone style wines that have become super popular and people see Grenache and they say, well, where else can I get a Grenache? And they end up in Spain and then they find something that's as delicious as that. That's, that's how I got turned on to Grenache. You know, and, and then particularly if you go to any, any wine retailer, you go and buy Gar Garnacha from Spain, you're going to pay five dollars to fifteen dollars and have an incredible drinking experience well, and then it's like well what the hell and on, <laughs> and on that note cheers cheers yeah, yeah, cheers to some grenache grenache so where are we headed now where we are headed now 
maybe my favorite wine region in all the world, Ribera del Duero. No kidding. You've got a you've got a, like a semi under the table. I do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is a. Uh, I think. Uh, oh, okay. You ready for a butcher pour? Let's see it. Look at that. Hold on. Ready? Oh, give me, give me that twist. No, come on. What? Let's just this? see if you like it first. Yeah. <laughs> what? I don't know how many wines we've had that we haven't liked on this show. I mean, it, I think we're batting like 95, 98%. I think if you're a wine person and you spend Here, leave it 20 on. to leave $50 it dollars on a wine, you're going to you're gonna find a way to appreciate that Unless wine. it's a cab and or drinking with Colby over here. Yes. I was such a Debbie Downer on that you episode. Totally it was, and I'm, I would like to issue a retort on this. Like, a an apology? <laughs> Not an apology. But uh, apology. I, I, I'm never wrong. I rolled my eyes at those wines, and I'm like, now thinking about it, I actually liked all of them. I know. What yeah. are your wines you talking about? We were drinking um, cabs. Yeah, we were drinking left bank cabs, and like I'm no, not a cab guy. Not left real. bank cabs. You're thinking of Bordeaux. I'm thinking about the left bank Bordeaux. Cab show. Well. <laughs> well, what are we drinking? The now? point is, my hatred of cabs is going away quickly. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know you hated cabs. I don't hate them. I just. I would drink 50 other things before I drink oh, cabs. Okay. But even Bordeaux? God, man, it's like... So, Anyways. Ribeiro del Duero, Tempranillo is the grape of Ribeiro del Duero. Oh. I think that um, this is one of the older wine regions in it's Spain. Definitely, it's definitely old. It is definitely, definitely old. old. Um, you're going to see wine produced... Um, super aging on these. This is probably one of the youngest ones I've ever had as far as like when it's been released and, and when it was made as 16 and we're just now releasing it. Um, what I think you see a lot in Ribera del Duero is where they're taking different vineyards and blending them, taking all high quality vineyards and blending, the, making the wine separately Correct me if I'm uh -huh. wrong. They make the wine separately and then blend it for that vintage depending on how each vineyard did each year it, and stuff. It, it's like, cool that you say that because it's not common. It's very much the champagne way of doing things. Like you take Tempranillo from great vineyards and you ferment them in separate lots and then you blend them back to make one wine that's 100% Tempranillo. 100% badass. Which is yeah. just incredible and people don't think of blends as that you know yeah 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 a single varietal blend yeah like, yeah which is fascinating because you create there's so much nuance within a given location uh, have you ever had a, an estate ribera del duero no. i don't know that it exists right like i don't mm -hmm. i've never seen it and and also like if you're in that part of um spain of spain where the river is going through it like the altitude and the soil change real quick, real fast, kind of like Bordeaux does. It's like one side of the river is this, and the other side right. of the river is that, and like, yeah. so the one north the is much cooler. The northern side of the river there is we cooler. Go. Yeah, um, I, I take that back. I think Emilio Moro makes a a, a single so, vineyard, which is available. But I mean, but you got to look for it though. Like yeah. the ter the way of making wine there is like we use yeah. some from here, from here, from here. We own them all well, and yeah. blend it when when. So All the vines are super old here. They're not trellis. They just kind of let them grow, right? Um, a lot of them are bush them? vine, dry yeah. farmed things. This is the coolest thing if you've never seen. We'll throw a picture up there. If you've ever seen a bush pruned vine, like we're used to seeing these beautiful things that are on trellises and da da da. This thing is like this mangy, like Medusa, Medusa looking thing with like a shoot sticking off this way and that yeah. way and all these crazy yeah. things, but like. <clears throat> So I came across this, this section in the Wine Bible that I, that I just loved, and I want to read it real fast. Do it. From the beginning of the 20th century until the 1980s, Ribera del Duero was a wine region primarily known for cheap, gruff reds turned out by cooperatives that had, built, that had been built with government subsidies. Mediocrity reigned. Most mm -hmm. wines, even as late as the 1970s, were made in unclean barrels and left unattended to ferment at will. Their wines were seldom racked off their lees, never filtered, and rarely bottled commercially. Customers simply arrived at the bodega with reusable containers and bought what they needed directly from the barrel. So it seems very... Like this? Yeah. <laughs> keg stands abounded. Yeah, upside down keg stands. Um, but it just seemed 
kind of an afterthought, but like this is what we do. We're going to press these grapes and then throw them in there and we'll let them ferment and then we'll come back in a couple months and start selling it. That's crazy to me because I feel like some of the finest wines come from there now. Like, and I don't know if that's a nouveau thing or whatever. Like, they're totally nuanced, but have a huge amount of structure. There's so much like, well, in the next paragraph it says an enormous turnaround came in the 80s. So it's, it's relatively new. Yeah, the amount of, of investment for sure. And, you know, people like Pingus and Vega Cecilia and Pesquera, I mean, all these iconic producers that come out of there are, are very much front of mind because they've taken the Bordeaux mentality of new French oak, shorter aging but with newer oak, which means that they have a market in the English markets, which means they have a natural market in the U.S. And so it's almost like people appreciate these wines more than they do La Rioja wines because La Rioja is still kind of a mixed bag of traditional versus modern. So and you don't really know what you're buying unless you know that producer. Here's a question to you or to both of y'all. Why did we taste this third? Because to me it seems almost the most, um, not lesser, well, yeah, lesser in body and almost, um, like I feel like we should have tasted this first. For me, like... He's gonna probably disagree with me. For me, it's the most complex wine. Okay. So, at least when we're talking about pre-show, I thought like, well, let's, because like we're basically drinking. Well, two of them were Tempranillo grapes. So sure. Like, for me, this had a lot more going on. I thought the first one was like just. It's also 2007 and like easier to drink, more age, ready to go. Like this one, like, you know, like. There's so much going on with this thing right now. Absolutely. I mean, he I'm, probably has a different answer to that. Uh, my answer is I think this should have gone second. Okay. Yeah, so, and then the pre-rot. I told you I'm wrong. Like, yeah, 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 no, yeah. I mean, the pre-rot kind of blew it's a, this it, yeah, it's out intense. of the water. Yeah. But, this but, is, but I also expected this Ribera del Duero to be m more. Like, typically when you have Ribera del Dueros, they're as dark as that pre-rot we had in the glass. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it, and that, if that were that case, then, then this would have been the proper drinking order just because this is a... It should be a bigger, more structured wine um, based off of what that blend was on the pre rot with Merlot in there. Sure. Um, but, the, and the reason for that is it has, it's an extreme continental climate. So super bitter winters, uh, hot summers, and then a, a, a big diurnal swing, and it's at elevation. So as a result, you get an incredibly long growing season, and that elevation ripens color and tannin more, so you get intensity of structure. Um, and so, in the best examples, these wines um, are typically the fullest bodied wines on the table just because of, of the climate in, in, a, in a good vintage year from, a, from a, a wine that's meant to be a little bit more serious. So, in talking about the temperatures, um, what was astounding to me is in this region, the summers can get up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, like a Texas summer. But the winters can drop it like down to like Sub -zero. negative, negative yeah. twenty degrees. Yeah, it's fucking crazy, man. It's crazy. Yeah. And then what did you? What did it say about? I'm sure the temperature between day and night in the grill is like oh, it's, thirty, or forty degrees different. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like, so yeah. it's it's really kind of warm during the day, which uh, inhibits or which uh, which I can't think of the word, which uh, improves the photosynthesis. But at night it gets really cold, which stops it. Right. So less the less the grapes rest and yes. chill out and like right. okay, let's get ready for tomorrow. Right. And make some more badass juice and like exactly. And if you notice, like of all the episodes we've done, like all the really one, like the ones we're like oh, they all have that going on, you yeah. know, where it's like hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. You just these polyphenols get to go boo, 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 and like yeah. and make this awesome thing in this little tiny grape. So, yeah, it's so important. Like, even in Texas, I mean, we have a 30 degree. If you look at the weather today, it's 101 yeah. and then 71. 104 today. Or 104 Shit. and then the low is 74. We have that 30 degree swing, but. <laughs> it's but, up here. Like, right down about yeah. here would be preferred. Like, yeah. yeah. If, if it was in the mid to high 60s, it would be obviously way better. Yeah, when, uh, when they say you're getting a cold front and it's going to drop down to 98. <laughs> next week, baby, next week. Is this that the is, end of the hundreds? Yeah, well, I don't know about the end, but uh, Tuesday is supposed to be in the 90s again. This is the dog days of summer that we're going through right now while we're filming. Um, yeah. This is amazing. Uh, this is my number one so far. Yeah. yeah. What'd that cost? Uh, less than 50. Less than 50. <laughs> 
I want to say it was like forty bucks. Oh, like, man, but, but for me, just just to find a Ribera del Duero under fifty bucks, period. It's a good deal. What I was was mind blowing for it's me. It's fantastic. Yeah, this is a good wine, I've, and and a super serious cork. Like that cork is probably like seventy five cents. So let's let's talk about this. What would you pair this with? Um, Jamon Iberico. Jamon Iberico is probably not enough, actually. Well, I mean, because like, the, the, the famous dish in this area is the milk-fed lamb. Mm -hmm. I can see, like, asabuco. Oh, man. I, I, for me, I want a sauce, something that's saucy. I yeah, lamb you. shank or something <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think lamb with, like, mint would go well. It's got that eucalyptus thing happening. The braised lamb would, would yeah. be great. Yeah. Okay, I'm cooking a braised lamb shank uh, next week. It's the I'm gonna best send you a picture. In. Dude, it's the easiest. Oh well, you know, but it's the easiest thing to cook. Oh yeah, put uh, ingredients in shanks. pot. And it's very, Turn it on. very inexpensive. Lamb shank is very inexpensive. We totally have to do a food episode. <sighs> yeah, I'm hungry. This is <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah, it's really pretty. So what what are you tasting like? If you, you sit here and taste this, like I'm getting all these, um, like. Um, Dark fruits like cherry and blueberry and raspberry, schnozberry. <laughs> the boys and berries taste like schnozberry. <laughs> Legan berry. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely black fruited. Yeah. Then blue fruited. Yeah. I don't get blueberries. I don't get like plum skin. I get more of a cassis. I get kind of like a cassis. Like so a, I was gonna ask if if you have that licorice undertone. You yeah. You get that a little bit. It's more red licorice than black licorice. Okay. Um, it's got a brand, like a nice brandied quality, like a can like a cordial, like a chambordness to mm. it. Chambord. I love that stuff. That yeah. used to be the the hot topper for frozen margaritas. What happened? To or that? champagne. Yes. Champagne. What's it a Cure Cure Royale? God, man, like I could do that all day. Yeah. Um, that was my mother's like. But go to the, the 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 dark tone there is really quite pleasant. It's almost got like this graphite thing happening. Um, what I love about this is the finish. Like, it just goes, goes and goes and goes. And, on. and I will tell you, that's, like, quintessential Ribera del Duero. I mean, like, those wines, proper ones, like, go forever. I, I mean, mean, I'm just sitting here just savoring every... Look, we keep pouring, pour all the other two wines, and we're still on this. No, no, this is, for, uh, this is my jam. Yeah. I'm excited to see what you brought. I brought something more akin to the Priorat. Oh, it's, it's, uh, oh, hold on, we gotta finish this one. Yeah, let's keep drinking. We got, <laughs> we, we've got, <laughs> apparently, we we've have got, a guest in the room. We've, yeah, we've, uh, we actually need to, we should try that other one. Well, let's open it at least. Oh, it's already open. It's open. Let, can I chug this real quick? You can I do know, whatever you want. Yeah. Here, can I, <laughs> I get in here? Daniel, I knew you would be good for this. <laughs> cheers, cheers to wide <laughs> shots. Wide shots. So uh, what time is it? Fuck me. No, hey. we don't. We can't no, tell. <laughs> it's uh, 8 p.m. <laughs> 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 it's uh, in our, it's our I had breakfast for dinner, let's just mm -hmm. say <laughs> This is great. I gotta before we finish this. I gotta say one thing. Oh, that's delicious! Uh, damn. It chugs better than it sips. <laughs> yeah. That is like a dull Gatorade, man. It's this highly this electrolyte rich. <laughs> Lots of antioxidants. Yes, I'm. I'm. Uh, let's just say I'm cured from my co Corona walking in here today. <laughs> my just anti rub it all over our face. My antiviral. So 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 Daniel did us a solid. First guest, by the way, that has brought us a gift. Yeah. Well, the, the rest I, I, eight I, of you. I've learned the best the, gifts to give are gifts that you can also use yourself. Yeah, I'm with you. So, you know, I'm like going to tell you what I know <laughs> about Monstat. <laughs> like, <laughs> Monstat is this mountain, right? And if you took a mountain like this and you drew a donut around it, would be Priorat, right? Mm -hmm. And so Monstas at the top and the bottom, either side of Priorat is... It? Uh, it, it's like a horseshoe. Yeah, okay, So all it's right. not all, all the way 100% Of course. Around. But uh, the same region, but I bet... Still Catalonia. But I bet the grapes, I mean, I bet the blend is fairly different than what we would do. Yeah, this is definitely more traditional. I think this is 60-40 Garnacha Carignan. Should be on the front. Wh which is... Yeah, or, or Carignan, Carignan Garnacha. Garnacha. 
60 Carignan. It's 60 Carignan? Yeah. yeah. Unbeknownst to me. These are two separate vineyards planted. The Carignan was planted in 1974. The Garnacho was planted in 1976. Um, this wine is made by a Texan, which is nice. No shit. Yeah, this is... Uh, you know this person? Yeah, Russell Smith. D.R. Russell Smith. Mr. Uh, Smith. Mr. Smith. Yeah. Uh, those two some of you may, whoever watched this may know Russell Smith. Russell Smith... Um, uh, worked for Twin Liquors for many years. Store number three in Westlake. Uh, That's my store. Is it? Yeah. So you know Chip. I do. Chip is a great guy. Chip is the guy that sold me uh, the rum that I want to get you to try. Okay. The, the Diplomatico or the other stuff? No, the Diplomatico. Uh, oh, like, it's so delicious, Diplomatico. Oh. No, no, but I'm talking about like the... I can't remember what it is. The Reserva or whatever that's aged forever and it's over $100 a bottle. It's Okay, yeah, there so is worked, a booze episode. We're going to have to do a booze uh, So episode. I worked at that store, too. You did? Yeah. Uh, with Chip. Our paths have probably caught, crossed more than... Yeah. The, so did we, you know Peter Gaddy when he worked there? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm going to duck out of this episode. These guys are just going to... Yeah. That's a fucked up story, <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, uh, I'm doing yeah, a benefit for Peter in let's December. Toast, let's toast to Peter. Yeah. To Peter. To Peter. To Peter, Peter. was I, my mentor and a uh, really incredible wine educator. And he really... He had a story for every single wine, like down to the dog's name at the at the place. And it was just amazing, his level of knowledge. So it, it, if he was your mentor, it came through because I feel like you're kind of the same way. Like I could like talk to you about some obscure region. And like, do you know about the, <laughs> well, I, the Labrador that was uh, that's a nice name? Oh, well, I mean, you know. I feel like uh, it's, a, it's, mm. it's all very humbling, you know? Like, I, I don't know half as what I, much as I think I know. Yeah, I know twice as much as I think I know. So. <laughs> yeah, so Russell Smith, no, Russell Smith uh, was also the winemaker for Becker Vineyards for 13 years. Really? Yeah, after he worked in Napa Valley at Flores Springs. He's doing um, great things. And uh, uh, when he retired, I guess that was 13. I could be totally wrong. 2013, maybe 14. And then uh, bought a piece of property that had these two vineyards on him uh, and started making this wine. Uh, and he makes a white, a rosé, and a sparkling, and then the red. The all red, under the same label? I think it's all, yeah. like, yeah, under Cellar Barcelona, Cellar D. Russell Smith. The label has changed over time. Um, it's available at Twin Liquors, I know, because of his history there. Um, but now he's also the winemaker for Barron's Creek Vineyards in the okay. country. Got it. But he's, we love this wine. We actually, who's the wine. Who's we? Um, um, so you're, you're me and wrong. him. <laughs> <laughs> me? Yeah, yeah. A frog in your pocket? Yeah. <laughs> me. I guess the people in the taster. You room. sell this at Venovium, right? Yeah, we, yeah, do, yeah. we do sell this. But it, it's super delicious by itself. Uh, and we also make a Bloody Mary out of it, which is kind of fun. That's awesome. Because it's spicy, savory, rich, bacony, uh, rustic. It makes an awesome wine, Bloody Mary. So I think this is the perfect wine to end on, the perfect wine to, uh, to salute Texas and all that Texas has to offer in terms of wine and winemakers and Vinovium wine shops, if you will. Um, yeah, we got a great scene here. We're gonna do a Texas episode. Like, oh, I know. You, you, everybody out there really needs to know. Like, you can look at the Texas wine industry in the last five years. And just nine day. If you ask any Texan what they're the most proud of, and it's being a Texan. So of course we're gonna be proud of our our wine industry. I think, um, and it, the great thing about it is it can only get better. Yeah. Um, so. I, I always, one of my favorite analogies uh, somebody once told me, I forgot who said it, is that uh, we, we think that it takes a hundred and, like the Lopez de Heredia, it takes 140 years to become a great wine, or more than that, you look at some of those no. French examples. But you look at what California did with the Judgment of Paris in 1976, and, and from the year that Prohibition ended, 1933 to 1976, 33 years, right? Give or take 10 years, like if my math is right. Your math is as good as mine. <laughs> uh, so in less than a 50 year period, they went from nothing to world renowned. And so I think it's just a matter of consistency, the, the, the ability to adapt to a changing environment, the willingness to learn new technique, 
and and then I also do think it takes the industry to have a concerted <coughs> effort to promote itself sure. um, to get it to that next level. And um, the, not to mention the business friendly atmosphere that Texas provides. True, which so, is huge. Um, well, guys, this has been amazing. Daniel, thank you for, Daniel, thanks for bringing this, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. This has been awesome. This we, is super fun. We hope to have you back. Um, You're coming back for the Texas episode. Yeah, sure, I would, fact, like, I would Spanish, love to. Spanish Reds has treated us well. Um, but until next time, I'm Quattro. This is Andrew. Daniel. Cheers. Coming from uh, for in. 12 Rivers Productions. Thanks. Like, subscribe or something? Up there. Up there. It's up there. <laughs> it was up there. I'll see you next time. Appreciate Thanks. it. Cheers. Is this YouTube? Cheers. This is YouTube, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah.